It was a fine spring morning, but there was an atmosphere of horror in the little kitchen at Scatterbrook Farm. For Mrs. Bloomsbury Barton had arrived, and what she'd had to say had left Mrs. Braithwaite aghast. Uh, speak, she gasped. Uh, me? <laughs> Get up in front of her entire village, Mrs. Bloomsbury Barton. Mrs. Bloomsbury Barton waved away the objection with a toss of her podgy hand. Oh, the briefest of perorations will suffice, Mrs. Braithwaite. Just the teensiest of talks. Forty-five minutes at the very most. Mrs. Braithwaite shook her head, completely bewildered by the idea of speaking at the Village Institute. But, but, what about? Mrs. Bloomsbury Barton swiveled round and spotted on the wide mantelpiece a pair of tiny Staffordshire figures and a huge Dalton jug. There, she pointed. Why not talk about your little pieces of pottery? A Staffordshire, aren't they? She'd levered her fat hips out of the chair and waddled over to the mantelpiece to examine the jug. And isn't this Dalton well? Oh, well, they're only ornaments. They, they've been in the family all donkey's years. Belonged to my mother and her mother before that. Mrs. Bloomsbury Barton rubbed her hands with satisfaction. Fascinating. That's all you need to say tomorrow afternoon. Just embellish it a little. She took down the big jug and thrust it at Mrs. Braithwaite. And you must bring it along to illustrate your little talk. I'm sure the entire audience will be a god. While the women talked, John, wandering idly down the lane, caught sight of Wurzel Gummidge and gasped. Crikey, Moses, he whispered. But there at the edge of a turnip field sat the scarecrow, pulling up turnips, examining them, and tossing them one by one over his shoulder into the hedge. Up it, he barked, catching sight of the boy. What are you doing, Wurzel? I won't tell you again. Buzz off. If I'm a breakway catches you, you'll go off his rocker. Dang, ditchy humans, worried in scarecrows. Ought to be a scarecrow law against it, so there should. And that ain't the one as I'm looking for, neither. Tarnation, take the pesky thing. But what are you looking for? Looking for me gardening edge, so I am. A written son might have buried it there. What, in a turnip field? Why not? Is a turnip ain't it? You want to help me look for it? Not likely, not here. Why for not here? Looking for a turnip in a turnip field? <laughs> You'd stand more chance looking for a needle in a haystack, cried the boy, scampering away. A what? What did he say? A, 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 a what not in a where for? A haystack. Haystack? That were it. Now I remember is where I put that there in. But you told that ditchy human where it were, eh? Hey? An hour later, the crow man spotted a commotion in a haystack and stopped with a smile on his lips. As he watched, a bale of hay detached itself and tumbled down, closely followed by the scarecrow, arms and legs waving as he rolled to the ground. Dang me if that there titchy human weren't right after all. Tis here, my gardening head, after all this time. Bies, weeds and turnips, but there'll be some railroad planting and sowing and weeding and owing going on now, all right. The crow man shook his head as he watched the scarecrow scampering away with his bundle. More trouble, Wurzel? He whispered to himself. Whenever you acquire a spare head, it always seems to work out that two heads are more trouble than one. The very next day, as if the weather itself knew that the scarecrow had found his gardening head, it rained. You aren't going to get much gardening done today, Wurzel, said Sue sympathetically, as they stared out from the shelter of the garage. The scarecrow clutched the sacking bundle that contained his head and sighed. Oh, it ain't fair, so it ain't, it ain't fair at all. And look out there, I've had this garden head all day now, and all the weather's done is chuck it down with rain. I ask you, what's the good of having a gardening head when the weather bent on your side? He put down his sacking wrapped head on a bench at the end of the garage and shook his fist at the clouds that hung over the farm. Oh, you could go out and plant some rice suggested John sarcastically. I don't talk daft. How could I go outdoors in weather like this with a gardening head on my shoulders? It didn't only need a drop of rain on it with an agricultural head like that, and it didn't start to sprout. Don't suit nobody, don't weather like this, and that's a fact. He suddenly froze as the farmer and his wife came into the garage to get the car and go to the village institute where Betty Braithwaite was due to lecture on her jug. How are you two? said Mr. Braithwaite in surprise. Ready already? Well, you just have to hang on a minute while I wrap this up. 
and grabbing an old sack, he carefully wrapped the jug and laid it on the workbench. He stared as he caught sight of the scarecrow. What on earth is that doing in here? The children looked at one another nervously. Um, I, I, I brought it in here, Mr. Braithwaite. I, I, I didn't think it wanted to get wet, said John. Mr. Braithwaite looked disbelievingly, then amazed and finally burst out in a great deep-throated guffaw of laughter as he turned to his wife. Well, he cried, I've heard of some things in my days, but bringing in a scarecrow out the wet, that takes the cake, that does. That really takes the cake. Come on, the pair of you, get in the car. He held the door open to let the children into the back seat, helped his wife into the passenger seat, collected a sacking-wrapped bundle from the workbench, and gave it to her as he got in and started the car. As the car drew away and disappeared down the lane, Wurzel Gummidge came to life with a face as dark and thundery as the weather itself. He shook his fist after the car. Here, yeah, as my head is done up with. He lurched over to the workbench and unwrapped the parcel left behind by Mr. Braithwaite. A jug. A pesky old jug for a gardening head. That ain't no fair swaps at all, so it ain't. Ah, uh -huh. you was taking this here jug down that institute place, wasn't you? A little rubbing web breast told me that, so he did. Making a speech and all, so you be. Well, missus, you can play at that game. You're not the only one as can stand up in public and say a word or three. Ah, sure And with that, Wurzel Gummidge stamped out of the garage and crossed the yard to the barn, where, hidden away in a cider barrel, he found a battered old Gladstone bat and pulled from it a weird-looking, mouldering, grey-green head with a laurel wreath round the brow, and a cracked, gold-rimmed, half-framed pince-nez perched on the end of its drooping nose. Oh, hi. Be speechy, if I did. Ha, ha. I hope it still works. Ain't had no call to use it for a year or four. Up no fortnight. Anyway, here goes. And he hauled and screwed and wrenched his workaday head loose, ramming and wriggling and squashing the speechifying head down into its place. He smacked his lips experimentally and coughed to clear his throat. Speech for speech, I pray, as I pronounce it to you, trippingly on the tongue. Ha <laughs> ha! Ah, it's as good as new! And he leapt to his feet and headed off into the rain. Outside the village hall, just as the rain finally eased off and a pale sun broke through the clouds, Mr. Braithwaite stood chatting with Mr. Peters. Not coming inside to see the fun, Mr. Peters? Oh, sorry, I can't. I've got this window to fix. How's Mrs. Braithwaite feeling? Nervous, is she? Nervous? No, she ain't nervous. Nervous ain't the word. She's petrified. Ah, she wishes were anybody else but her doing it. Her husband laughed and wandered into the hall to take his seat at the back of the audience. Behind the stage, in a little anteroom, the farmer's wife was petrified. Mrs. Bloomsbury Barton was brandishing her very best smelling salts under her nose, and they were doing no good at all. Now pull yourself together, Mrs. Braithwaite. You are going out on that stage to address a few friends. Now that is all. Oh, I couldn't feel no worse, Mrs. Bloomsbury Barton, if I was going out to face a firing squad. And that's the truth, moaned Betty Braithwaite unhappily. You really must pull yourself together. Or some sort of action must be taken. Even if it means my going out and delivering your little talk myself. A ray of hope dawned in Mrs. Braithwaite's eyes as Mrs. Bloomsbury Barton's words gave her an idea. So she began to moan even more pitifully. Outside the hall, as Mr. Peters climbed his ladder and examined the window, the scarecrow crouched behind the hedge, watching with narrowed eyes. I would say to the house, as I would say to those who have joined this government, that I have nothing to offer but blood, toil, tears, and turnips. <laughs> but if we stand by and let humans steal scarecrow's head, no scarecrow's ever going to be able to call his head his own. Here, here. Bravo. <laughs> Mrs. Bloomsbury Barton strode imperiously out onto the little stage of the village hall just as the audience was getting restless and starting to mutter about its tea. Dear friends, she called, and slowly silence descended over the room. Uh, dear friends, uh, some sad news first. Mrs. Betty Braithwaite has suddenly been taken unwell and is unable to appear. However, it was Mrs. Braithwaite's intention to talk to you this afternoon about the various quaint ornaments and common or garden knick-knacks to be found in the ordinary people's homes. Well, I think I can safely say that I have visited a sufficient uh, ordinary homes to be well qualified to speak to you on Mrs. Braithwaite's chosen subject. 
So my little talk this afternoon, therefore, is called Working Class Paraphernalia. Now then, are we all sitting comfortably? Break a break found in ordinary homes. Now, I would like to point out, although it is the exception rather than the rule, that occasionally one comes across an exciting find that may prove to be quite valuable. Now, this happened to me only yesterday, and I brought along my little discovery to show you. But I'm not going to stand here on the stage and hold it up for all of you to see. Oh, no, I'm going to ask you to pass it around amongst yourselves so that you may feel the texture and examine the color. A little girl, hand this down to the front row for me, she commanded, a passing the parcel to Sue. But, uh, Mrs. Brooms, pardon. Do as you are told, little girl, she insisted. And as the permit was unwrapped, and solemnly passed down the row, she went rambling on with her speech. Of course, as you can see, the piece you are looking at could not, uh, under the circumstances, be described as priceless. A farmer poked and sniffed the turnip, and nodded his agreement. Uh, nevertheless, it is, as I'm sure you must all agree, a rare and attractive object. Ah. Three ladies and the young wives giggled together as they tried to imagine it in an art gallery. And I know that each and every one of you would be delighted to have one of your very own to grace your mantelpiece or sideboard. As the turnip travelled along a second row, and then a third, the audience began to shudder and shake with suppressed laughter. What's going on? said Mrs. Bloomsbury Barton to Sue, who could barely control her own giggles. Please, Mrs. Bloomsbury Barton, but it's a turnip. What is? What they're looking at. Nonsense, girl! It's a perfect example of 19th century... Her voice faded away and her jaw dropped as the turnip arrived at the front row once again. Sue solemnly handed it up to her and there was a brief moment of silence as the hall watched her staring open-mouthed at the grubby, muddy vegetable. My lords, ladies and gentlemen, came a rich, deep voice from the back of the hall as Wurzel Gummidge, with his speechifying head in good working order, marched in, bowing right and left as he spoke. Friends, Romans and countrymen, lend me your ear. I come to tell you that the pan in your pocket is better than the wind to change you know it makes sense. Oh, ah. And furthermore, if me right honourable colleague on the other side of the chamber don't hand over me garden and head, she'll be well and truly sorry. Because I can stand here blathering a no lot longer than what she can. So how about it, missus? He finished, striding onto the platform and sweeping the turnip from her grasp. He examined it for blemishes and strode back again down the hall, still speechified. Alas, poor Yorick. I knew him, Horatio, a fellow of infinite jest. Oh, ah. And in conclusion, I would just say this. Up with me and down with everybody else. At the door, he paused, bowed low, and swept out for a furious round of applause while Mrs. Bloomsbury Barton slowly fainted to the floor. The next morning, when the dew was still wet upon the grass and there was a breathless quiet in the air, the children woke early and strolled through the quiet woods to the garden of the crow man's house. There they could just see the scarecrow's gardening head over the hedge, and that he was sprawled out in a deck chair, making the most of the early sun. Hello, Wurzel, they called happily. Why aren't you in Ten Acre Field? Ah, well, doing a bit of gardening for the crow man, so I am. Gardening? asked Sue incredulously. That's right. Mowing this year lawn for him, ain't I? John sneered. Sitting in a deck chair. Oh, huh? ain't nothing like a gardening egg for finding a means of doing a bit of agriculture the easy way. The children ran up to the hedge and stood on tiptoe to peer over. And there, dotted all over the lush grass of the crow man's lawn, were dozens and dozens of rabbits, nibbling busily away at the grass. Ha <laughs> ha! That's the way, me little beauty. We'll soon have this here lawn trimmed just the way the crow man wants it. And you shove off, you little titchy humans. I'm too busy to chit-chat with the likes of you. Here it comes. The scarecrow's voice drifted over the hedge and followed them, wheedling now. Oi! If you ain't got nothing better to do, you might have a scout around and see if you can lay your hands on a bottle of ginger beer and slice a cake or two. Makes a body hungry, gardening does. And it's thirsty work and all, so it is. Oh, I... The children smiled happily at one another. Up the workers, muttered John. Too true, his sister agreed, as they strolled out through the woods towards the rolling hills.